technology, we've got a bit of a different take on it. We're normally looking for new technologies, so that might be a new method, it might be a new way of delivering a drug, it might be a new way of editing a genome. And what we really, what we nearly always ask ourselves is, is number one, is this interesting? Is it an interesting story? Number two, is it enabling, um, you know, someone in a lab to tackle a question they wouldn't have been able to tackle before? If the technology is not new, it doesn't mean you can't publish with us. It could be that it's not new, but it is applied in a new way. So, for instance, if um, CRISPR has been applied in animals, that wouldn't stop us publishing CRISPR being applied in plants if, though, if the paper also revealed some new biology and showed that it was, uh, you know, potentially a game-changing uh, technology. Every paper is individual, of course. And if you're thinking about improvement, if, you, if you're producing a protein, for example, that is a really important protein to produce a therapeutic, and you make improvements to that pro, uh, process, we'd be looking for a really big improvement. If you get a smaller improvement, it would be suitable for a less selective journal. Because if you look at the journal every month, you can see we only publish up to 10 research papers a month, and we get about 150 submissions a month. So that shows how much is rejected. So when I'm sat at my desk every day, um, what do I do? Well, mainly I'm vetting manuscripts. So I'm, I read all the manuscripts in full. All the editors do that. We read all the pre-submission inquiries in full. And we discuss all those manuscripts with at least one other editor. If we're going to send it to review, we normally discuss it with the whole team. And it's a bit like a journal club format where I'll come along and say, oh, look, I've got the pigeon pea genome. And, and then my colleague Marcus will say, what's pigeon pea? Why do, I, why do I care? And I have to kind of defend the manuscript, if you see what I mean. I have to advocate for it. And we go through all the results and have a look at it and see whether it looks like it would be a good fit for the journal. Once we've decided it's a good fit for the journal, we send it out to review. Now, I would say that at most of the selective journals, the way the editors work is if they decide to send something out to review, it's because they want to publish it. Uh, if the reviewers then kill it by saying there's lots of technical problems, there's probably not a lot you can do unless you can solve those problems. The reviewers might also come back and say, actually, it's not interesting at all. That doesn't happen very often. Um, but we try and whittle down the amount we send out to review because the reviewers are busy. As you all know, um, multiple requests come weekly to review articles. And again, with the launch of so many more journals, then there are ever, ever many more pressures on everyone's time. So if we're asking someone to review a paper that is full of data, you know, it's data rich, it may have algorithms that need testing, it may have extensive methods uh, to read, that's going to take someone several hours to a full day or even more of their time. So we don't want to send them things that they then turn around and say, you know, no, this isn't new, this isn't an advance. So we have to be pretty careful about what we send out for review. And the other thing we do is go to conferences, Networking with researchers, you know, typically then you might be asking a researcher to submit, consider submitting their research to your journal. Um, and you also be thinking about commentaries, reviews, writing features, that kind of thing. So we have quite a lot of different things to do, but handling the manuscripts is definitely the main part. So here is a diagram just showing the life cycle of a manuscript. So the manuscript's been written and it comes into the journal. And as I said, we will look at it, read it, discuss it, and then make a decision. So that might be to reject it, or it might be to send it out for peer review. Um, the role of a professional editor is, you know, to make sure that you spend quite a bit of time selecting reviewers. So I should say this is probably, you know, a good chunk of time, maybe two or three hours sent picking out about 10 people that might be able to review the paper. And you're looking for people to look at it from different angles. You might want someone that's really strong on methodologies, someone that's got a bit of a big picture view of the field and can tell you about the advance, maybe an expert in the exact system that's been submitted to you. So we'll, and we need to find about 10 or 12 people who might be able to do it because as you know, a lot of time people say no. <laughs> So you need to go to your next choice. And once we've got the reviews, we'll sit around and, and we'll discuss them. So if it was my paper, I would have to summarize those reviews, you know, the, the positive aspects of them and the problematic aspects of them. And then I discuss them with my colleagues and we discuss where to go next. Um, usually we invite a revision. Um, 
if, you know, if the reviewers are favourable, we definitely invite a revision. We may overrule on certain experiments that, that, that reviewers ask for if they seem like they might. If they're going to take more than six months, we'd overrule it, I would say. Or we might decide that because so much more additional information has been asked for, we'll say to the authors, you know, we can't publish this now, but if you come back when you've done X, Y, and Z, we'll reconsider. And it could go around in that cycle twice. Most papers are not reviewed by peer reviewers more than twice, or they probably shouldn't be anyway. Um, but it's rare. Uh, and after that, it's either accept, reject, uh, either go and resubmit somewhere else, or you might decide that you want to appeal. So I'd like to think a little bit about how to write up your results now. So before you start, you need to think about what makes a great paper. So most great papers obviously are, are formed from great research, but when you read a really nice paper, it's usually because it tells you a great story. It'll outline in brief what's been done before, uh, and what's the outstanding question in the field? It will tell you what the question is and that they're going to answer it, and then they'll show you all the data and say, this rules out this, this, that, and the other, and here's our result. Here's the answer to the research question that we set out at the beginning of the paper, and that's a pleasing way to read it. Um, most papers don't come in written like that at all, actually, um, but by the end of the process, we, we try and make that the focus. And writing so that someone like me, who doesn't work in the field, can understand it. You have to ideally look at it from the perspective of someone that doesn't know anything about it. So it's probably quite a good idea to give it to, you know, a friend, someone who's not really au fait with the science that you're specifically working on. It could be another scientist, but they're in a different discipline, for example. You want the title to convey very plainly and simply what you've done. What's the major finding? That should go in the title. You want the abstract to convey some of the results, ideally in a quantitative way, rather than just saying, we've done this and it's great. You say, we've tackled this, we show this, this, that and the other, and conclude that. And then you can go into the paper in more detail. Um, I quite often hear people saying, oh, I expect you only read the title and the abstract. I mean, that isn't true, but if the, ti if the title and the abstract are really poorly written, it won't help you if you're sending in, for example, a pre-submission inquiry where that's all you get to send. If you send in a full paper, the editors will read it. But it's worth spending some time thinking about your abstract for a start. The abstract's the thing that goes on PubMed. So if you haven't got an interesting and informative abstract, even when you've got published, people are gonna sort of search on PubMed and then think, hmm, can I be bothered to read that one? Perhaps not. So we spend a lot of time working on abstracts. And I think some of the ways you can try and work out how to present this, uh, your data in the best possible light uh, to go back to basics, to pretend that you're explaining it to, you know, a news reporter from the BBC. So you need to tell them, why is the topic interesting? What exact question are you addressing? Does your st study deal with a big problem or issue in the field? Sometimes these things are really obvious, so people don't write them in the paper, but they're not going to be obvious to someone like me that's, you know, not a specialist in implant research at all. And does your work change the current thinking in the field? That's probably particularly important if you're going for one of the really big journals like Nature Science or Cell. Think about the broader context and impact of your work. Are there other groups of people that might benefit from reading it? You can include that kind of thing in a cover letter. Think about how you've done it. Are you using already known methodology or is there something interesting or novel about your methods? Have you had to adapt a method to suit your system? These things need to be brought out. And uh, I would say don't overinterpret. Um, you know, good, good data and a good story does not need overinterpretation and, in fact, tends to annoy reviewers. So, when you're planning your publications, and I understand that, you know, a lot of projects have huge amounts of data, and, and it's not really a good idea to try and cram it all into one paper. But try and avoid salami slicing. Um, this <laughs> I always find this a bit funny. Someone, someone gave me this slide. Top tier journals will ask for the whole sausage. And funnily enough, he's German. So <laughs> maybe sausages are a big thing for him. But um, 
I think this is true. People don't like to hear that they've got one part of the story and Journal X has got another part and Journal Y has got another part. They're thinking, why haven't they put it all together? Now, you don't have to put it all together. It's up to you how you publish your work. But you can consider what I've got down the bottom here, pitching a set of papers to an editor. Because quite often nowadays you're collaborating, there are different authors, and everyone needs to have a paper that they can say is their paper for their own um, you know, promotion um, CV. So you can consider pitching a set of papers which together tell one whole big story. Most editors find this quite difficult to resist. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm worrying now looking out here just thinking I'm going to get loads of sets of papers, but I, I know that people do like it. And it can be a good way to pre-assess, if you see what I mean, um, which journal is likely to take all the papers or whether an editor is likely to work with you to say, okay, well, we can review these three papers and, and my colleagues at NatComs have agreed to review those three papers. So, it, you know, it can, it can really help to discuss what you want to do with an editor beforehand. And so whenever you see editors at conferences, which will probably be quite often, it's a good idea to get to know them because you can find out what they're interested in, how approachable they are, and if they're open to um, being approached about things like this. And, you know, in these days of consortia, it does happen more and more often that people will come to us and say, you know, I want the main paper to go to nature, but I've got these other papers, would you consider them? And, and that often works out very nicely. And they do it at other journals too, not just at the Nature journals. Um, so you, when you're deciding how much of your data to put in, as I said, you've got to think about the students and the postdocs and, and how many people need to have a paper out of the project. Um, but I would say be selective. I have on occasion had papers where there's so much data in them that the reviewers have in fact asked the papers to be split into smaller set of papers that each has its own message. Um, so cramming it all in isn't always a great idea. It can lead to difficulties in getting it published because no one really knows what the main message is. It's nice for each paper to have one main message. And when you're organizing your paper, it is really important to set out the research question. I've raised this a few times, I know, but it's so often uh, not until we get to the end of reading a paper that we understand what the research question was at the outset, and that's not the right way around. You, you really need that set out early on. Think about the best way to present your findings and which things really need to be in tables and, and figures and which can be, which can be left out. Um, look at the journal you're intending to submit to. See if they publish the kind of papers that you uh, are writing. And if they don't, it's probably not going to be a, a good idea to submit there. You, you ideally need to find a journal that publishes the type of research that you're doing um, because that shows that they've got editors that are interested in that research. If it's a collaborative effort, you do need to think about who will write what. Um, I think it is quite nice to have co-authors, co-lead authors, but you do need to ensure that everyone has read each other's chunks because sometimes it's quite obvious that four people have written it um, in turn. You, you can just tell when you read it. Uh, and this is one of these quotes uh, from someone else who's a, an academic editor who said that, you know, having a lot of weak data does not make up for having less but more powerful data. I think it's okay to try and publish if you've got one really strong result and you can submit and if the editors and the reviewers are interested, you can always have more data in a revision. That does happen. Um, but trying to cobble in lots of other data that's not necessarily relevant or is weak is, is a bad idea because you'll probably be asked to remove it anyway. Pre-submission inquiries. Um, people either like these or they don't. Uh, the advantages are they're normally dealt with very quickly because editors are, are told by their managers at the company that they have to be dealt with very quickly because they're typically short. So we're meant to turn them around in one or two days maximum. It does give you an opportunity to gauge interest. You could send a pre-submission inquiry to me, to someone at Science, to someone at Cell, to someone at Nature, to someone at Nature Genetics. That's fine. You can send pre-submission inquiries to any amount of editors that you want to. So you can write the same one and then send it in to several people. And it gives you a sense then of who's going to be interested. And if you need to, you can then get in touch with them and follow up and say, what about if I include this, or what about if I don't include that? And you can help gauge how much data they're expecting to see in the submission. 
The disadvantages of these are that you need to be very convincing in a page, which can be difficult. So what you need to say in a pre-sub is similar to a cover letter. You need, to, um, you need to say why the field is important and why it should be published in the journal that you're aiming at. You need to tell them what research question you've addressed, what type of method you used, maybe include one or two figures to, to, to showcase your really exciting results. Um, and do mention a little bit about the prior papers in the field so that it's clear that you have made an, a substantial advance or a new contribution. The other thing to consider when you're submitting your paper finally is recommending or excluding referees. Um, some journals have different policies on this. I would say it's much more important to tell the uh, editors who you want excluded than it is to say who they could include. Um, Mainly because, you know, if there, there, there are specific people you really don't want to review the piece, you, you want the editors to know that. And most editors do respect, we respect this 100%, unless someone's excluded everyone in the whole field, which occasionally does happen. <laughs> and the other thing is conciseness. Now, this cartoon's meant to illustrate this. Some people can use, you know, 500 words when three will do. Um, it's definitely worth remembering that not only editors, but readers. Readers are time poor. Everyone's reading things on their phone now. They want to scan through it quickly. They want to get the main message before they've got to the end of the first or second page, or they might give up reading. So make sure you get your impact out in your abstract. And the cover letter. Now, uh, it might be the first thing some editors read. I, it's the last thing I read, actually. I don't like to read cover letters first because sometimes um, some people are so persuasive or so off-putting in the cover letter that it, it kind of, you know, I, I feel like it can prejudice how you feel about a paper. So I leave that till last. But I, I sample the rest of the team and everyone else reads the cover letter first, so I must be unusual. I think when we were at PLOS, we were told to not read them at all. And in fact, they stopped accepting cover letters. My, my boss felt that it could introduce some form of bias, but anyway. When you're writing a cover letter, things to avoid definitely are, you know, Dr. Jonathan Jones read my, uh, read my manuscript and thinks it's brilliant. It makes no difference, even if I'm his best friend. Yeah, makes no difference. In fact, I, I find it off-putting, to be honest. Uh, or X, Y, and Z suggested I submit. And then when you next see X, Y, and Z, you find out they didn't suggest that. That's another no-no. <laughs> if, you, if you tell the editor someone has suggested they submit, it needs to be true. Um, I'm not suggesting anyone here would do anything nefarious, but um, I'm just telling you what I have come across in my own um, experience. So you need to summarize the advance. In the cover letter, you can talk about other things like, you know, perhaps cost. This is a really cheap way of doing this, Susan, so it's going to revolutionize uh, the uptake of the method. Make sure you've got a bottom line that an average reader, you know, university educated reader could take away. Don't get bogged down in technical details at all in the cover letter. That's what the paper's for. If you're saying you've done something for the first time, you have to say why it's important, you know, why it might be important going forwards. And you definitely need to do this. You need to say this research should be published in Nature Biotechnology because, and, it might, and the best reason for that would be, um, you know, you've got a history of publishing these types of genome sequence. This is an excellent addition and it'll make this difference and that difference. It's a brilliant resource because it needs to be something relevant to the field that we publish in. You must mention interactions with uh, members of the editorial team because, you know, in many cases, it may be that I've met you and I've said, please send this in. So include that in the cover letter, just in case it goes to one of the other editors because they will then say, oh, Susan, you've obviously chatted with this person and give the paper back to me. And avoid hype. I think, you know, after you've been doing this job 15 years or whatever I've been doing it now, um, you, it just it just rankles a little bit to, to read any overhyping. And certainly when we're editing manuscripts, that's the first thing we want to take out. Because in general, it doesn't pan out that it is the best thing ever. It's not to say it's not good, but you don't need to hype good results. So, so you know, you just don't need to do that. Uh, so I've got a few vignettes here of what referees have said about papers. And, and usually, uh, 
referees, even expert referees, want particularly computational methods, I should say, explained in lay terms. You know, you take your input sequences, then they're filtered with this program, then they're filtered with that program. Quite often it's just like we applied the algorithm and, and there's no explanation. So you need to explain complex methods. Try not to invent new abbreviations. This doesn't help reading a paper. If it's littered with abbreviations, it really does um, put off referees actually even more than, than than, than readers. Um, brevity is something that's worth thinking about all the time. Can I say this in less words? Can I just, you know, get rid of all the discussion here and just give the take home message? And it is really worth thinking about the structure of your paper before you submit it to any journal because once you've submitted it, it does get quite hard to completely rejig it. Um, if you've got time and a uh, you know, an editor has got time to help you reshape it completely from the bottom up. It does occasionally happen, but more often than not, you, you, you can become saddled with a structure that doesn't really work for your data. So it's really worth thinking about spending, you know, a good few days thinking about how to write your paper up and look at um, the structure that you've adopted. Um, you can't expect the reader of the paper to have read all the backstory like you have. Um, so you do need to refer to the relevant portions of the literature and set your research in context. It's really important to do that. So you can think about this a little bit like a map. You can draw it out, in fact, uh, you know, like one of these mind mapping exercises and relate all the papers to each other and look at what the different objectives were and say where your slot's in. And sometimes I do this when I'm reading a paper. I, I make a kind of, you know, one of these sort of bubble maps, mind maps of um, the field and where this sits. And if the reader, you know, if the writer's done that for you, that's really helpful because it immediately tells the editor, who's the person that's deciding whether to send it out, whether you are filling a gap in current knowledge or whether you are addressing an unmet need. Um, and we have had this, referees have come to the end of a paper and say, you know, I couldn't work out what the question was or whether the experiment was the appropriate answer to the question. It was probably a paper we shouldn't have sent out to review, I'm guessing, but um, yeah, you know, those things really need to be in there. So I think I've talked long enough now. So um, the research is the main thing. You know, you have to get that right. Obviously, you have to have good data. Once you've got exciting data, you really need to set it in the context of your part of the field. If you can tell a complete story, that will make it easy to justify that it's of broad interest. And if you can solicit external feedback, you know, and this can just be from, you know, so a, friend in, a friend in your house, for example, just, you know, can you understand what I was tackling, why I was tackling it, and, and what the end result is. They don't need to understand all the science to be able to get that take-home message. Most editors will have specialized in one field like I did and they will, you know, gradually by going to conferences like this absorb exactly where the state of the field is. But you, you really need to lay it out for editors. Just imagine there, your average Joe, you know, like me, and you've got to explain it to me. And uh, at the end, once you've got your paper accepted, then um, I usually spend about two days, depending on the, the paper, um, trying to help the author to, to really hone the message so that it, it comes across really well. And that is something we take quite seriously at Nature Biotech. We edit all our papers from start to finish. And I know from experience that they don't do that. Most of the Nature Journals, uh, let alone anywhere else. So it's one thing that you know the chief editor insists on. Um, but we find that it does help because having a good title and abstract really helps the papers to get the um, to get out there and your message to get across to all the people that you want to read it. So the editor should help you and at all times you should contact the editor if you have any concerns because they should be responsive because they are now the advocate for your paper throughout the whole review process. That's it. Good. <laughs>